All right, we are starting the... I don't know. I guess I'll just call it air hockey. We can call it pong. I don't know. It's all good. But it's round paddles, so we're going to call it air hockey. We're starting our air hockey project. Air hockey. Woo. Hey, thanks so much for those of you who still put your name at the top of the project. I salute you for your excellence. I'm going to put my name at the top of my project, too. <laughs> I'm in all the blocks for this course, I guess, but uh, right now we're in one, three. Thanks for those of you who noticed this day one. I did not earlier. Whew. All right, so we are going to go ahead and add in uh, the a few just like, essential things. We'll do it together this time. But guess what? You guys are almost ready. Like Some of you are ready. Ready. Already ready? What? I don't know what I'm saying, but you're, you're good to go. I bet I could leave uh, probably half the class, and you can all get the mode framework all set up and all those kind of things. But I'm going to do it one more time with you just to make sure it goes smoothly. And anyone who's like, oh, I don't know, last project didn't go so great. Um, or you just have forgotten because of winter break, right? I, I imagine a lot of people have forgotten some of the details. This will give you a chance to see it one more time and hopefully make it pretty smooth. And those of you who are ready to go and just and rock it, uh, you know, feel free to, to skip ahead if you want. So I'm going to put in everybody's favorite functions, void setup, void draw. <coughs> And guess what? I'll put in void mouse release while I'm at it. That's going to be for our clicks. And I'll just stop there. We'll do some other things later on. Thanks, Mark. Wait, one other thing. Um, would you say it's better to do void mouse release or void mouse attack? Depends on the situation. It's never bad. To, well, I guess there's, a mouse release can be bad. Uh, for like the target clicking game, for example, when we release the mouse and if that's when we're aiming at the target, then that doesn't really feel great, right? Like, it's when you put the mouse down, that's when you feel like you should be getting the hit. Um, but sometimes mouse pressed causes some problems. So I've just always used mouse released, but feel free to experiment and see what mouse pressed gives you. And there's also mouse clicked, but I always just kind of depend on mouse released. In some ways, I don't want to get too complicated. There's three flavors of mouse something or other, right? Uh, it can basically just does fine. And we got lots of things to worry about. So generally for everybody in the class, I'm like, yeah, mouse release is good. However, the fact that you noticed that is interesting and you should totally follow that, um, that uh, intuition. You're like, hey, what about this? So try them out and see how they go. Totally, anybody else, feel free to uh, deviate from this in, in ways uh, in it that you're experimenting with. Totally good. But I'll just keep it standardized to make sure everyone is feeling good with this so far. I guess we need a size for our project. That's probably the next step, hey? So let's put in a size. What size would we like to do? I think uh, typically these games are wider than they are long. So I'll go, uh, or sorry, wider than they are tall. So I'll do 800 by 600 for my size. And then I'm going to go put in my good old mode framework. So I'll probably need a mode variable here. Int mode. Now here's where I'm going to do something that's different. Uh, than the mode framework last time. It's actually not different in any major way. I'm going to make a slight change just to make the code more readable. And that is actually a major concern in software engineering. Because it turns out software is made by humans. And humans make mistakes. So if you can, and especially, uh, actually I should say, software is not just made by humans. It's made, of, made by teams of humans. Teams of humans that have to read each other's code and figure out what's going on and communicate to each other and tell them how their code works. So if you can make your code read like a sentence, that's fantastic. And that's actually the goal for everybody's program eventually. I'm not too concerned if that's not happening every minute of the day, but try to work towards that. Try to make your code more and more like a sentence. And so to help that out, instead of having mode just like one, two, three, four, five, and just to have kind of random numbers, there's no reason intro should be one or pause should be four or you know, it, we'll just use words. So I'm going to make some variables that are the words for those things. And there's still going to be numbers underneath it all, but we'll kind of disguise the numbers with a, with a label. So I'm going to make mode intro. So I'll make an int, int variable called intro, and it's going to be number one. And I'm going to make a play mode. It's going to be number two. And I'll make a pause mode will be number three. And I'll make a game over mode. Whoops, I messed up my formatting. The, the, this doesn't matter, I just like to do it. I don't know why. <laughs> it looks pretty, is my answer. And there's no more justification needed. There it is. 
Uh, there you go. I've just made a whole bunch of modes. Is there any other mode I'm missing? I think that's good, right? Pong might have some other modes. Now you might wonder what's the point of doing this. So I'll show you. Maybe I'll give you a second just to type it down. I still hear lots of clickety clackities. All right. So here's the story of why this is useful. So now instead of saying mode equals one or mode equals two or three or four or whatever, I can say mode equals intro. And if uh, Noah uses one for intro, but Jason uses four for intro, and Sasha uses two for intro, and I use seven for intro, it doesn't matter because it just says intro. I don't really care what the number is. I can just read that code and be like, yeah, you're setting it to the intro mode. And it's good. And check out how our mode framework framework looks now. I'm going to go to draw. You guys just wrote this on your quiz, so you're probably fresh and good to go. I'm going to say if uh, mode equals intro. Uh, else if mode equals play. And if you're choosing different words for these, that's okay. Because this still will make sense to me. If you chose game or you chose playing or whatever, like I can read it and use my knowledge of language to understand what's going on. If it says if mode equals 7, that doesn't actually mean anything to me. So that's great, hey? Mode equals uh, pause. Else if mode equals game over. You could put a final else if you want. I think I'll just leave it out. Uh, that tended to trip people up more than help people. Whoops, my, uh, I pressed control T and it went a little bit too dense. Now, anybody could read this and kind of understand what's going on, right? If mode equals intro, like that is actually a pretty close to a grammatically correct sentence. <laughs> the double equals is a little bit confusing and there's parentheses and braces, but I bet someone who's ever done any programming could kind of make sense of what's going on there, right? And that is a goal to work towards for all programs, is to make them more readable. There's entire programming languages. Uh, Python comes to mind as a famous programming language that most engineering programs do in their first year uh, that is designed to make code more readable. Java and processing are generally considered sort of a little bit on the other end of that spectrum, a little bit on the worst readability scale. So uh, do everything you can to make it readable. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to actually take this mode framework, and guess what? I'm going to select it. I'm going to copy it, I'm going to paste it also into my mouse released function. Be careful to make sure you put it actually inside, right? So before the close brace and after the open brace, like here, is good. Don't put it afterwards or you'll cause a lot of headaches for yourself. <laughs> and I guess I'll control T, just it'll condense it, but then you can see everything that's on the screen. So if, you're, if you end up like getting stuck on something, don't worry, Like we'll come around and help you out at some point. I'll probably just blaze forward and, and make this, like go through this setup part as, uh, as fast as possible. Don't be too sad if you have like a red line somewhere, just, just leave it and keep going along. We'll fix it, we'll figure it out. But yeah, there you go, there's our mode framework for the draw function and our mode framework for the mouse released function. It's all separated into separate modes so we can solve those problems separately. Uh, and it reads like English, so congratulations. We have unlocked like a new level of programmer skill. Uh, next is adding in all those functions, because right now this does nothing, right? Mode is one, two, or three, like nothing actually happens. So we're going to go and put in our functions that will be sort of the separate things to, to do. So in the draw function, I'm going to have functions like intro, like that will draw the intro screen. Uh, play will be like the actual game itself. So. Uh, you could call that game, or I'll just, I'll just call it by the, the mode. Play. I'll make a pause function. I'll make a game over function. And if you needed to add in more, then you, know, you could go ahead and add more later on. <laughs> yeah, thanks to uh, you gentlemen who are facing the wrong way. I know you get a lot of core exercises you have to turn to see what I'm doing. Sorry that you're at a slight disadvantage. Hopefully it's uh, only making your yourself stronger <laughs> and not making things harder. Luckily there's a YouTube video if uh, you get too far behind. All right? 
Yeah, actually, I guess there is a pause function somewhere defined. I don't know where or what it does, but <laughs> okay. It's fine. We'll, we'll make our own. Hey, oh, yeah, do you feel weird when those are red lines? Are you, like, itching to go, like, not make them red? Don't, don't worry too much about it. Uh, this is, like, a classic programming uh, technique called top-down programming where you assume that those functions do what they do, and you just type in wh where you need them, and then later on you'll go and define them. You sort of think about, like, what are the functions I'm going to need? And in this way, you're sort of making a list of things to do. Like, I need to go make a function that draws an intro screen, a function that draws the pause screen, a function that draws the game over screen, and so on. Uh, I'm going to leave those red for now. I'm going to go down to mouse released. And you know what? Man, did mouse release get ugly. Last project. Did you notice that? Did your mouse release function turn into a, like, mess of ifs inside of ifs inside of ifs? Like, there was, it was so messy. And I noticed that was where a lot of students, like, that's where their mistakes were happening. So let's, uh, let's separate them out a little bit. In the same way that we're separating out our draw function, I'm going to put in functions that will handle the clicks in different areas. So when I click the mouse, if mode is intro, I'm just going to hand off the program to another function. Let's just make, like, a mouse clicks function for each different mode. So I'm going to make an intro clicks function. I'm going to make a play clicks function. And again, these functions, what they're going to do is just like look at the mouse and decide what button was clicked. Or do nothing if you didn't click on a button. I'm going to make a pause click function and a game over clicks function. And in doing this, it separates it from the main if else. So hopefully it'll be a little bit cleaner. They won't like run into each other and make it so hard to see what's going on. Here's my game over clicks function. All right. Now they're all red, and we're going to solve that in a second. I'll just let everyone catch up to us, and then we'll go and soothe the red functions. They're like, I imagine they're like swollen, like painfully, like like they got hit with a hammer or something, and they're like in pain. And then we're going to go solve it. So here we go, draw function mouse release function. We now have eight functions. We've broken down our big game into eight functions. And that's great. That's called uh, decomposition. I think I mentioned this last project. In computer science, you take one big problem and you break it down into eight smaller problems that are theoretically easier to solve. That's decomposition. That's a, that's a good thing to do. It's easier to separate into the smaller problems. Just solve one of those problems at a time. So the new thing we're going to do today, one of the new things, we already did a couple of new things, is instead of putting the rest of the code down here and having like eight different functions and scroll for days when we're trying to find things. Does anyone ever get lost in your own program? You're like scrolling, scrolling. Oh, wait, 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 no, no. Scroll back up, scroll back up. Wait, no. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll up, down, up. Oh, oh, there it is. Like that's kind of annoying. And some of you were super good at it. I was really impressed. Like some people were like quick with it. We're like, boom, they went straight to the code. I'm like, Whew, that's pretty good. But I don't blame you at all if you were finding it difficult to find stuff in your 800 line program. Like some, I saw a program, someone did a program that had 2,000 lines in it. They had like 12 different targets and they were all like unique in their own things. I was like, and they were like, it was a, the scroll bar was a dot. It was crazy. It was so small. So, you know what? Guess what? Like, big programs aren't written all in one thing. Like, Windows isn't this like, million line long file of like source code. They actually get written in different uh, files. And we're going to do that as well. In processing, you can have a bunch of different files all in one project. All you got to do is open a new tab. And you can write new functions in that tab. So check it out. I'm going to go make a new tab. And this is going to be annoying a little bit. But just, just go with me. Just go with me. Here we go. I'm going to zoom in so you can see what I'm doing. Maybe. Over beside the, the main tab, this is a sketch. Did you guys ever find out what those numbers mean? This is 2019. Zero one is January. 15th is the day. There you go. That's what, the, what those random numbers are in the, in the default sketch. Uh, anyways, I'm going to go make a new tab. And I'm going to make a function. It opens up a little window somewhere. Here it is. It actually says name for new file. Because you're going to see that there's multiple files being made. Don't let that freak you out too much. Nothing's changing. Everything is, you could 
put everything in one tab or you can put them in separate tabs. It's all good. But I'm going to give a tab for each different mode. So all the code for the intro screen will be in one tab. All the code for the game over screen will be in another tab. So I'll just type these in. I'll zoom out. You can do the same. I'll make one for intro. I'll make a new tab. You can press Control Shift N apparently to get a new uh, tab. Uh, I'll make one for uh, play. I'll make one for game over. I'll make one for uh, pause. Now some of you are inside freaking out right now. And some of you are like, have no idea what I'm talking about. But if anybody right now was very upset by the fact that it did it in alphabetical order, instead of putting it in the order, then I will help you right now. I am the same way. I'm like, leave my tabs alone. I want to order. I want to click and drag them into the order I would like them to be in. Some people will not care. They're like, whatever. What, what's the big deal, Mr. Pelche? But some of you know what I mean. Some of you are like, no, I want them to be intro, play, pause, game over. Like that is like, it's just bugging you. Unfortunately, it's alphabetized. And you can't type in numbers, but you can type in letters and underscores. And so here's what I'm going to do. And this is optional, only for people who are concerned about this problem. If that's you, like, like me, then I will go to intro and I will right click and rename the tab. And I, oh, I have to save the sketch first, sorry. Control S. Uh, let's save it here. I don't know, what do I call it? Pong. It's air hockey, but I can't stop calling it Pong. Okay, now I'm going to go rename it. So intro, I'm going to rename, and I'm going to put an A underscore in front of it. This will not affect anything to do with the mode, by the way. You have to go rename your mode variables. Uh, I'm going to rename play. <coughs> to be B underscore. I'll rename pause to be C underscore. Again, all t entirely optional. And D underscore. Here we go. A, B, C, D. Then it, this is just getting around. It's annoying. Auto, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Automatic ordering of the tabs. And, you're, and if that helps you, great. And if, it, if you are just sitting there going, just get on with the Mr. Pelsey, I don't care, then don't worry, I'm going to get there right now. So remember, each of these tabs is going to be all the code for that mode. So what do I need to put in for the intro tab? Well, I need the intro function and also this intro clicks function that's going to deal with my mouse clicks. So in intro tab, I'm going to type in void intro. And I put my open close braces. And I'm going to put in intro clicks as well, the, the function that handles my mouse clicks in the intro mode. This is no different than just putting it all in the first tab. In terms of the program, it'll run just fine with it here. It will run just fine with it in the main tab. This is entirely for our own benefit. So when you want to go work on the intro mode, you can just click on this tab and see all the code right there for that mode. That's the only reason we're doing this. This will not make it run better. It will not make it run different. It will run exactly the same, but it's an organizational strategy because that's half of programming right there is just staying organized as you go forward. Can you imagine what goes in the play mode? Yeah, it's gonna be void play or whatever you named your mode. Uh, yeah, game, great. If you. I, I realized after I did this that last time we did game, sorry. If you want to stay with game, that's okay. Uh, and void play clicks. This is the function that will draw the game. This is the function that will register clicks during the game. And determine what happens when you click in the game. Yeah, it makes sense. I bet you can make the pause tab now. It's the same thing. I'll go to the pause tab. Void pause, that's the function I wrote in my mode framework. Also void pause clicks. Same with game over, I'm gonna do the same thing. Void game over and void game over clicks. Awesome. Yeah, Mark. Why do some like little orange lines appear by the 
I don't know. I don't see any. <laughs> I'll come check yours out at some point. Uh, it's probably fine. <gasps> oh. I never noticed that. But I can make him go away. Watch. I made him go away. Oh, that's so good. Thanks, Processing. This must be new for Processing 3. I never noticed this. But um, if you make a change to a tab, apparently it makes a little orange line at the end of the tab. So if I start coding in game over, if I'm like, or no, I'll do, I'll do play. If I start coding in play, notice. Wait for it. Thanks for noticing that, by the way, Mark. There's no orange lines here, but as soon as I start typing, first thing I'm going to do is background. Do you see what happened? It made an orange line. That means there's been a change that has happened that you have not saved yet in that tab. And that's another good reason to use tabs. Because now you can keep tabs. Oh, no, I shouldn't have said that. You can <laughs> That was terrible. You can see what you've changed in your program. I can now at a glance see I have not changed these two tabs or this tab since last time I've saved. It also reminds you to save as you go. No, if you press Control S or just like File Save, it'll save all the tabs. So hey, that's cool. I didn't know that. I'm glad we looked into that. So if you've done this, I invite you now to press Control K and look at your folder. Control K. Ooh, look at that. You have now five files. Then you haven't saved your project yet. So you won't even have a sketch folder if you haven't saved your project yet. So you have to save it and then check it out. I got my... Which one do you open? It turns out it doesn't matter. If you open any of them, it'll open the whole project. As long as your folder is named after the one that's the main tab. So if your Pong game with the Pong tab is in the Pong folder, you're good to go. It'll, it'll figure it out. So that's cool, right? We got multiple files, and we're good to go to make Pong. That was a lot of work. We just did this like 20 minutes, probably typed in 60 line of code, of code, and nothing actually happens. Like if you run this sketch, like there's, it's actually doing nothing. So I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it, this is classic. Do you know that in software? The highest paid people don't code. I mean, maybe for a small company, like everyone's got to code because it's a small company, but a big company like Microsoft, there are people, like the highest paid programmers are not programming. They are designing the software. They are making the structure. They are figuring out how everything should work together. They're probably sitting around tables with whiteboards and stuff like that and they're not actually typing in the code. They're sort of doing the structure part of it. And that might not be entirely true. There might be people that are sort of working on some like algorithm that's like really complex and they might need to get in and start doing some code. But eventually, like if you are, if you want to keep on moving up, like that's the direction you end up going with is the planning of the software. That's actually the hardest part of software engineering is the design of it not the actual construction. We're sort of like the construction workers right now, hammering the nails in and putting up the boards for the house and like laying the foundation and stuff. But it was the architect that was like the person who sort of invented it. They never got their, they didn't put a hard hat on, right? They didn't get their, uh, they didn't get their hands dirty at the work site. Or they, maybe they do. Some architects will visit the site, of course, and stuff. But that's sort of like an eventual trajectory for your career if you want to be that person that is just making all the plans and stuff. So. We're going to kind of be both people. We're going to be the planners and the coders all at the same time. And now, uh, let's actually make something happen in our game. Because you know what? If we left today and that's all we did, like people will be so disappointed. Actually, I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't care. But I would be disappointed if you walked away with nothing but structure. Because honestly, at this stage, it's so fun to make some program do a thing. And we're going to make the keyboard do stuff. Today, we will make it so that when you press up and down arrows, a circle will move up and it will move down. And it's going to be great. And we're going to use this for the rest of the year. So I look forward to showing you guys this. So here it is. Uh, I am going to set my mode not to intro, but to play. And if your program does nothing, 
then it's probably because you forgot to do that. He's like, ah, it's just a gray screen. I had a lot of students last class. Not a lot, but a few. Who were like, my program doesn't, it doesn't work, Mr. Pelshin, as they forgot to do that step. So I'm trying to highlight that right now. And I'm going to make a, a simple ellipse that's just going to go up and down. It's not going to be in the corner of the screen or the left of the screen or the right of the screen. Um, so just let's just make a nice little uh, paddle that, or a circle that moves up and down. If we make something move, we're going to need some variables, right? Up and down, uh, we're going to keep track of the Y coordinates. We might as well control the X coordinate as well. Maybe you're going to make an aggro mode for your, like, Pong games. You could, like, go and, like, like go out and challenge or something. I don't know. That'd be kind of funny. Uh, so I'll, I'll add in variables for my paddles. I'm going to make uh, X and Y. Well, I guess we're going to have two paddles, though. We should probably prepare for that. Let's make all of our variables right now. Oh, it should be floats, too, by the way. Let's make them floats. We might want to move them up by some thing. You might have forgot a semicolon. Take a look and see if you, you got all your semicolons. I'll, I'll come and take a look in a bit. Yeah. Oh, I just, uh, I want to put this in my game. Because eventually our paddles are going to move in the game. I guess you can make stuff move in the intro and then move it over. But I figure I might as well make my paddles now and just put it in the game function or the play function or whatever, whatever you guys call it. So I'm just going to set that there. I'll skip my intro screen for now. Okay, so I'm going to make, uh, what should our variables be for our, our uh, left paddle and our right paddle? What do you think? And this, by the way, is a bit of a challenge. There's, there's not necessarily a right answer to this. But there's probably better answers and worse answers. Here's an example of a bad answer that I've seen students choose. A, B, C, D. No. Don't do that. Like, don't, don't make your X and Y for the left paddle A and B. You will eventually make a mistake. You'll forget which one's controlling what. It'll get confusing. Uh, also, like, which one's X and which one's Y? Well, it's not terrible, right? Like, it's still in alphabetical order. I can see worse variables, but these are still pretty bad. So what else could we do? Jason. Uh, oh, yeah, you could link them to the keys. It turns out, um, it turns out we're going to need those variables for the key input stuff. So this is just where is the paddle. So does W correspond to X? Like A and D move you left and right, they'll affect your X, but they're not really the X coordinate. So I probably I would probably advise against those variables still. But good try though. I think it's uh it's true we will have a variable called W, A, S, and D by the end of this project, or something to do with that. But I think for the X and Y variables we will probably stick with something with the letter X and Y in it. Just to remind ourselves what it is. Sasha, what do you think? Yeah, that's not bad. So that, like, if we have a lot of things with X's in it, there's going to be a ball too, right? So how do we keep track of, like, ball X, paddle X? And then do we call it one and two? Uh, do we call it left and right? What do you call it? There's so many, like, questions. And, I mean, honestly, these aren't too big a deal right now. If you called it X1 or, like, X left or X right or X2 or whatever, you would be okay. You'd be fine. You'd probably be able to figure it out. But do consciously choose these variable names and try to make a pattern. Like if you call it, say I choose paddle x uh, 1 and then paddle, make it paddle x 2 for the, the next one and make it ball x as well. Like keep it consistent. Don't call the ball x like Steve or something. Like don't like get like too crazy. Like keep it consistent with your pattern. Personally I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll forget, is player one the left or the right player? When I'm making a two-player game, I get confused like that because, I don't know, I think that's pretty common. So I'm probably going to call, and I also, I don't know about typing paddle over and over again. You guys feel that a little bit hesitant too? i got to type paddle x1 equals paddle x1 plus paddle x vx. Like that's going to get, ooh, it's going to get kind of hard. I think I'm going to err on the side of concise. I'm going to make it paddle. Uh, I'm going to make X. And I'm going to use right. R for right. And Y right. I'm going to make X left, Y left. And I'll probably make 
Um, X ball, Y ball. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it really works for me. And there's they're clearly different, and they're short, so I won't get annoyed with my own variable names. And they kind of mean something to me. Like I can I can sort of see those things in there. But guess what you can do at the end of your project if you're like, oh, I was so lazy. I made such bad variable names. You can right click and rename your variables. So at the end of your project, you want to make it like descriptive, like it, replace it with the word write and not have typed in the word write over and over again, but still make it look like you re really cared about the people that were reading your project. You can click and rename them to like, at that point, they'll all rename. So while you're programming, it's nice to have them be short. I'll choose these variable names, but a lot of those names people chose were not bad. Like they're still pretty good. And I'll, I'll invite you to make your own choices. But these are the ones I'll use. It's kind of nice to put some comments here. So I'm going to actually separate these on three different lines. Say right paddle. Just in case I forget, there's uh, somewhere I can look and see the answer to what these are. Uh, left paddle. And I just can't type today. And ball. I'll put in coordinates as well. Okay, so we're good to go. I'm going to go make now an ellipse, and this will be the ellipse that I'm going to control. I'll do it in which mode? I'm going to do it in the play mode. I don't know why, just because I felt like it. And I'll make an ellipse. I'll make this the left one. X, L, Y, L. I'll make it uh, 200 by 200. And when I run this, I guess it's going to be at 0, 0. That's fine. I'm okay with that. If you rather have it somewhere else, you can move it somewhere else. And now we're set up to do a little bit of keyboard input. I know it's been a long class, so thanks for staying uh, focused, everyone. But we're finally going to get to something that's brand spanking new you have not seen before at all. Well, actually, some of you I know have because you did it on your own, but most people haven't seen it. But we're set up. I'm ready to make that XL and YL change. Well, specifically, I'll make the YL change. I guess it's going to go up and down. So I'm going to take you to the main tab. I'm going to go to the bottom of my project. See mouse released here? Well, guess what? There's also key released and key pressed. I'm going to put those functions in right now. It's key pressed with a capital P and void key released. We're going to use both. And if you will indulge me, I'm going to show you the wrong way to do it first. Because the wrong way makes sense. You're going to be like, yeah, that looks good. And I'm going to show you why it doesn't work. And then we're going to fix it. And I think if I just show you how to make it work, you'll be like, that's a lot of work for nothing. Why do we go to all that work? So I hope that you don't mind. You guys mind if I just, just show you the wrong way first? Here's, it'll show you some of the right stuff. There'll be some of the ingredients you need. Uh, and you might think, well, okay, I'm going to press a key. This, this function happens anytime you press any key. If I press the scroll lock key, this function will run. And so what you do in here, inside of the function, is you say, hey, was it the up arrow? And if it was the up arrow, do something. So you can type like this. I can say if, and then how do you know what key it was? Well, there's a built-in variable, variable. You know, like, uh, like mouse... Uh, mouse X is a built-in variable. You know, it's always like automatically updated by processing. Well, there's one called key code. It turns pink just like mouse X. And it keeps track of what was the key that was pressed. Every time you press a key, a, this function gets called for every separate key. So if you just like face palm, wait, you face your keyboard, like slam your keyboard into your face, it will call it however many times the keys are, whatever number of keys are pressed. So that's great. And I can ask, hey, what is the key? The up key. So how do you do that? Well, you do use double equals because you're seeing if it's equal to. And then you type in all caps, up. And guess what up is? It is a constant. It's a final int that processing has defined. Oh, I never did final. Oh. I'll keep going. I'll tell you about final later on. I feel like I've, I've robbed you of an experience. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It's all good. So... What happens if you press up? Well, we want to make that thing move up. How can I make something move up? I can subtract from its y-coordinate. So I can say 
Um, y, I'm using L, right? Equals YL minus 10. I can also put in uh, down. I bet you know what down is. Key code equals down, all caps. I can say YL equals YL plus 10. And if you read that, it looks pretty good. And it will move our circle up and down. But I'll show you why this is bad in a second. You can go ahead and run this and see in advance. It is just an ellipse with XL and YL as my variables. Right there. But I'll put this on the on the screen because people are trying to get this working. Void key pressed. Anybody get that to work? So I'm gonna I'm gonna run it and just show you. I'll just put it over to the side so you can see the code. If I press up and down, it moves it. Woo! But it's a little choppy. By the way, uh, when you open the window to make it move, I don't know what I just did there, you have to click on the window. The key press stuff won't work until you give the window focus. So if it doesn't move at first, make sure you click on it. And then see if it moves up and down. I'll put the screen back. Oh, no, no, don't close. There we go. So click on the screen and it should move up and down for you. Yeah, did it work? Yeah? No? All right. But do you notice this a little bit weird? Like it's kind of ch it has this weird pause. It'll pause and go up, pause and go down. The first time I press the key, it happens, and then there's a delay, and then it starts moving, but kind of in a slow, choppy way. That's because of your operating system. Your operating system messes up your keyboard input, and it does it on purpose because of typing. Your operating system wants to make it easy for you as a human being with these like long meat pucks. They're just like sticking into these keys to like make that happen. There's a built-in delay every time you press a key and you can see it in the circle. I'm going to press it right now. Watch. You're going to press it and there's a delay. That delay is designed for the computer to sit there and wait for you to let go of the key because it is moving so fast and us slow humans are typing. You probably noticed that before. You might have, in Word, like, pressed, like, I don't know, letter F. And you typed it, you press it, and it pauses, and then it starts typing Fs. You've probably all experienced this before. And it's what makes it possible for us to type without, every time I press a key, getting, like, six Gs. So that's great for typing, but that's not how video games play, right? Like, you don't, like, press on the, you're playing a video game with, like, a game uh, pad, and you press left, and then the character moves forward a little bit, and then pauses, and then moves forward some more. So we have to do a little bit of work to circumvent our operating system, which is making our keyboard work well for word processing, but terrible for games. So here's how you do that. So I'm going to go to the top of our program. We already got a lot of variables for a game that doesn't do anything. I'm going to make some more variables. I'm going to make a Boolean variable. New variable type unlocked. Yes, <laughs> a Boolean variable. I think we might have used before. It's a variable that is either true or false. There's only two possible values. True or false. Yes or no. <laughs> Zero or one. And I'm going to make a Boolean variable for each key. So right now I'm going to make an up key variable and a down key variable. Up key and down key. And these variables will be true or false, yes or no, am I pressing this key? That's what it's going to do. All right. Are you ready for this? Here we go. So instead of directly changing my uh, values here, I'm going to not do that. Instead, I'm just going to set the up key variable to true. And I'm gonna in when I press down, I'm gonna set the down key variable to true. Well, we are gonna make it false, because remember when I press the key, it's gonna set it to true. But how do I know I'm not pressing the key? Well, guess what? They made a function for that. It's called key released. When I release the key, it calls the function key release. So I can say, hey, uh, if the key code of the key I released was up, uh, all caps. Then I'm going to say up key equals false. 
And if I release the key that was the down key, I'm going to say down key was false. And I'll try and get this all on the same screen so you can see the whole thing. There we go. Pretty close. Yeah. See what I'm doing there? So now when I press a key, I'm going to turn on a switch. It's called up key or down key. They're just, I'm going to have a different switch for each key. It's a virtual switch that I can turn on and off when I press and release the key. And if the key or if the switch is on, I'm going to move the circle. And if it's not on, I'm not going to move the circle. So these are going to kind of turn into remote controls that will control the circle's movement. And right now, all they do is turn a variable on or off. So I'm going to use that variable in my play function. So I'm going to go to the play tab. Here I am in my game. Here's my ellipse. You know where, you, where that is in your own code? Go ahead and find it. And I'm just going to, it doesn't matter where you put it. I'm just going to say, hey, if the up key variable is true, that means I'm trying to move that circle up. And so I'll put that code here. YL equals YL plus, or sorry, minus 10. And if up key, or sorry, if down key equals true, I'm going to go YL equals YL plus 10. So our key pressed and key release functions just turn on these Boolean switches. And in my game, I can look at the switch's value and see if it's turned on or off. If it's turned off, it just will do nothing. But if it's turned on, it'll start moving it up or it'll start moving it down. And while you're typing it in, I'll just run it. And you can just experience, it's so smooth. You press it, you release it, it just moves so smooth. Because it's overriding the operating system. All we're doing is turning on switches. We're not sort of depending on that delay anymore. We've circumvented the delay. Say again? Yeah, don't forget to click on the screen. Like click and like shake it around if you if you have to. <laughs> you don't you shouldn't have to, but there it is. And there you go, moving up and down. Yeah, Mark. Good question. Uh, that is up to you if you want to do that. Uh, that's okay. I would totally support that decision. Um, it turns out that I, I often, when I do my programming, I just use my main tab for all the default functions. And I am going to make this code a little bit tighter, a little bit shorter. So, yeah, this is actually not how I program in my own key press stuff. It turns out that these braces, if you have exactly one thing that happens in an if statement, you can forego or just omit the braces. So you can change this code. Yeah, I know. It's sort of, I, I, I hesitate at the end of an hour of listening to me talk, like tear apart your understanding of how braces works, which is already maybe a little bit tenuous. But it turns out that if you have like more than one line, like you need those braces to say when it stops or starts. But if there's just one line, you don't need to put the braces in. It default will assume if you put no braces that only one thing will happen if that's true. And then you can put it all in one line. And then you can condense those, those functions a lot. And so I end up coding it like this. And that kind of reads nice, right? If key code was up, set up key to true. If key code key was down, set it to true. And I do the same thing with my uh, key release function. And if this is weirding you out, it's optional, but it will make your code a lot nicer. cleaner, maybe nicer. Uh, I would call it like clean. Of course, you might get into trouble later on if it turns out you need to put in more than one thing when you press the up key. But spoiler alert, it won't happen in this project. You, that's all you're going to do. And you might go, wait, 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 Mr. Pelche. That, that's how I'm doing my mouse release too. I just got one thing, so could I get rid of my braces here, too? No. Yeah. Oh. You could, if you were bold. And as I've heard, fortune favors the bold. I believe it is. Uh, so, uh, this is optional. I'm just going to show you how you could format it 
if you wished. You could actually format it without the braces because there's exactly one thing that happens. And if you like the looks of that, if that looks good to you, then totally go with this. If you do not like the looks of this, ignore me and don't worry about it. This is entirely just style. It is something to make your code a little bit skinnier, but it does make it a lot skinnier. And that that's, can be a good thing for finding errors. We're going to end. Like, we got five minutes left. And I bet there's a whole bunch of people that are like, their code's not working. I apologize. We're not, probably going to run out of time to go and find those little mistakes that have happened. However, I want to show you how you can do W and D key as well. Because that's the classic like, other pair of keys for going up and down. Although feel free to like get all crazy and make it like tab and shift. Like I don't know, you can you can go nuts and make it whatever keys you want. But I'll show you how you do um, the letter keys and number keys and keys that have symbols. Because it turns out you you have to use a code for the up key. Because when you type up, it doesn't make a symbol. It moves the cursor around. So there's no way that I can type the up character in there. But I can type the W character, right? There, I just did it. So it's a little bit different for things that have symbols attached to them, like letters. So I'll show you how it's different. It's not a lot different, but it's a little bit different. So I guess first I'm going to make a W key. And this is, hey, I remember we said we're going to have a W variable in here. Here's our double key, W key and D key. I can see I'm looking out there. There's people got their phones out. People are like, oh, I'm exhausted. I can't think anymore. I, I relate. I'm sorry. I understand. This has been a long class. Don't let yourself like fall into that trap of tiredness, though. Take a look for just four more minutes. Uh, here we go. Here's W key and D key. I want to go down to key press and add in the W key. Here's how it's slightly different. Instead of key code, it's just key. You don't need to use key code because the key is just going to be W. And so I can say if it equals W, but it's not W like this. It's W with a single quote around it. Not double quotes, a single quote. And unfortunately, W can be either lower or upper case. So let's just check for both. So I'm going to say if it equals W or if key equals capital W. That's above your enter key. It looks like the backslash would press shift and type it and it'll give you the vertical bars. That's or. So I can say, hey, if, uh, if it's W or capital W, then I'm going to set W key to true. And if it's D or capital D, then I'll set W key to true. Well, we're going to have two paddles, so you're going to need two sets of keys. Because it's Pong, and you're probably going to play against another person. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Hey, you could, by the way, just kind of copy and paste this. It's dangerous, though. Watch out, all you copy and pasters. This happens so often. Excellent programmers will copy and paste and forget to change things. And then they'll ask me why it went wrong. And it's totally understandable because humans do these kind of things. But just right now, commit yourself, if you're going to copy and paste, to carefully read over what you paste. So, for example, I want to do the same thing for my key release but I want to set the W key to false. So make sure you type in false for those values. So this is how it's slightly different for W and D and any letter you want to press. Number, symbol, the space key. People always ask me, what's the key code for space? Here's what it would be if key equals space. That's the space key right there. You can actually type in a space. I know it's invisible, but that's the space key. We're not going to use space key this time. But eventually, you're going to want to use the space key. It's the biggest key on the keyboard. you got to use it. So there you go. That's how you use space key. Not really important for Pong. Wait, I have a question. Yeah, thanks. Can make the What a great question. So I would go and to my play mode, I'd probably draw two ellipses. And I'd probably have two sets of if statements. And one would control one ellipse, and one would control the other ellipse. So right now, this one controls the left ellipse. But you know what? Why would I make the keys? The person sitting on the right is going to use the right keys. I mean, the arrow keys, right? Like, the person sitting over on the right side of the keyboard should probably have the right paddle. 
So I'm actually going to change this to W key and, and D key. And hey, there goes the bell, folks. Just to prove that it works, I'll run it. And, uh, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, oh, wait, it's, it's S key. I lied. W A S D, isn't it? S that goes down? I'm sorry. Well, this will be on YouTube and everyone can laugh at me. Uh, so go and change this to actually S. I just, I'm just dumb. Sorry. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll go back uh, next class. We'll make that change together. And thanks for listening to me talk all day. Next class, just a reminder, your target clicking games are actually due today. I didn't come and check them, but next class I'll be coming around to look at them. You'll have some time to start making your game. Uh, and you'll probably just be left to your own devices to make things like your intro screen, your pause screen, your just uh, getting a ball to bounce around. You can do all those things. So I'll be leaving you to do those things for next class while I come around and check your project, but I'll give you a list of what you need to do. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll see you on oh, Thursday.